All right. Well, welcome everyone to the second installment of the Marlboro College Alumni Speaker Series on Zoom. Uh, my name is Maya Segura, class of 1991, and I've been the alumni director at Marlboro College for just under two years, although about now it feels like a lifetime. Um, the series began live on the Marlboro campus just over a year ago, and through it, we have featured over a dozen remarkable alums working in areas such as academia, publishing, public radio, creative economy, and sustainable business development. And tonight we have with us Denis Ellis Bichard, class of 1997. Okay. Um, Denis is the author of eight books of fiction and nonfiction and the winner of the 2007 Commonwealth Writers Prize for Best First Book, the 2016 Midwest Book Award for Literary Fiction, and 2015 Nautilus Book Award for Investigative Journalism. His photojournalism has been exhibited in the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. His articles, fiction, and photos have been published in dozens of newspapers and magazines, including the Los Angeles Times, Salon, City Lab, Reuters, The Paris Review, The Guardian, La Repubblica, Huffington Post, Harvard Review, and National Post, as well as Foreign Policy. He has reported from India, Cuba, Rwanda, Colombia, Iraq, the Democratic Democratic Republic of Congo and Afghanistan. While at Marlboro, Denise planned work with J. Birje Patil and T. Wilson, who we hope is with us on the call, the call here tonight, was rooted in writing and literature and was entitled Fabricating the Self, Creative and Critical Explorations of Identity. And this is a theme which you will find is heavily explored during the discussion this evening. Tonight, Denis will talk about his most recent work, A Song from Far Away, which was released by Milkweed this week. Co-hosting with me today is Ian McManus, Marlboro College Professor of Comparative Politics, and some of you may remember him from the Arthur Magida event a couple weeks ago, as well as Bronwyn Tate, uh, Professor of Writing and Literature. Um, before we get started, uh, I just wanted to address a couple of little housekeeping issues. Um, as we get closer to the Q&A portion of the evening, um, we will ask you to type your questions into the Q&A icon that's either at the top or the bottom of your screen. And um, the structure for the event will be the reading by Denis, discussion with Ian and Bronwyn, and then we'll take those questions. We understand that you're all signing on to Zoom from different makes and models of laptops and tablets. So the views and functions may vary a bit. Um, you are the only one who can choose your view, but we do recommend that you watch this via full screen. We also want you to know that we are recording this event. So without further ado, um, Denis Ellis Bichard. Hi everyone, and um, I, a lot of people in the audience, it's uh, funny to call it an audience, I've never done this before, so this is my first time reading with a virtual audience. A lot of people in the audience I know, and I want to say thank you to all of you for coming tonight. I really appreciate it, and I'm excited to be sharing this virtual, my first virtual book launch ever with you. Um, so I'm going to be introducing a song from far away. This is the Canadian edition, this is the American edition. I marked my reading passages in the Canadian edition. It doesn't show any preference, just it's the first one I grabbed. <laughs> and um, the, uh, so this book is a strange book for me. It's a book that I've been working on for 20 years. It's a book I never thought I was gonna publish, but I kept going back to it and thinking, oh, should I throw it in the trash? Is this hopeless? And it was a, a book that I began working on with an idea for stories about artists during wartime. And I thought, how do artists navigate wartime, how do they respond to war, how is art used as propaganda for war, I had all these questions and I began writing these stories, sort of exploring this question and the book grew to about 700 pages over the course of a decade and it did not work. I showed it to a few people and they said, no, this doesn't work. And um, then it began evolving. The, 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 a family, a certain one particular family began to grow in the book and I began to have very dramatic revisions to the story and I began to throw away a lot of the parts of, 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 to the novel and began, I began throwing away a lot of the stories and focusing in on a, a certain number of them 
and, and in on one family in particular. So I'm not going to say too much more about it because I know there are a lot of questions later that are going to sort of explore how the book works. It's a, a relatively short book, um, a little more than 200 pages, but it covers 150 years in the course of one family that splits um, and, and sort of has very divergent fates, but then at the same time, very similar fates. Um, and I'm going to start reading a story that's in the first person. <clears throat> because um, I think it kind of gives the reader a sense of how we enter into this, wor um, into this world. And it's about two brothers, one who's Canadian and one who's American. And the American is, is, is the half brother and the story is told from the point of view of the Canadian brother. And the Canadian brother really resents his half brother who he discovers quite late in life. He discovers him when he's a teenager. And the half brother is American. He, the, the, the Canadian brother, Andrew, views the half brother, Hugh, as a redneck and loathes that the half-brother looks more like his father than he does. I mean, the half-brother is also a, pro a product of his father's infidelity towards the narrator's mother. Um, and so after this half-brother comes into his life, the narrator, Andrew, um, begins the sense that his girlfriend, Natalie, this is Andrew's girlfriend, is attracted to Hugh, the American half-brother, who's full of vitality, full of life. And this insecurity that sort of that, that this creates in um, Andrew sort of, uh, it, it corrodes everything in his life. And he, he's an academic, he's highly intellectual, he thinks he's superior to his half-brother, but he begins to, to doubt all this. And then when 9-11 happens, his half-brother drops everything and goes off to fight in the Middle East. And this further sort of gnaws at the narrator. Um, and so I'm gonna read from a section where the narrator, Andrew, is he's already proposed marriage to Natalie once and she's refused. And he's gonna propose um, marriage to her again. They've just moved to Boston. She's originally from Boston. They moved from Canada to Boston in the opposite direction of what he thinks any sane person should be traveling um, during the Iraq war. He told her, you know, with all the liberals fleeing America, isn't Boston gonna be a ghost town? But they go back to Boston because she wants to be back in the United States. And this is the, the second time he tries to propose and convince her to marry him. It was in a Boston restaurant two months later after I arranged to finish my doctoral dissertation at a distance, took a job as a substitute high school teacher and moved into an apartment in Cambridge with Natalie near Central Square that I proposed again. For the first time, we'd found a harmony in shared activity in changing cities together and choosing a neighborhood and in a place that we painted and furnished. But for me, there was always a lingering question of what would happen when we had nothing else to do and fell back on old ways. So I planned the proposal, each element, including myself, gym fit and tanned from a carefully observed quota of hours outdoor. I researched marriage proposals online, learned how to select a ring, reserved a dinner flambe in a place where people knew to bow from the waist, tipped the evening's violinist beforehand to strategically ring out his heart. On one condition, Natalie said that night in the restaurant, romance fluttering off like sparrows around a kicked soccer ball. Other patrons were watching, murmuring, fluttery themselves, and I wished the hardball of her voice would scatter them too, or else that she'd be happy, however briefly. What, I whispered, on my knees, gripping the table as if begging for food. The violinist, a dapper Vietnamese-American man, had his eye on us. I expected dulcet tones, mood music, but he began to move his arm violently, the rising waves of sound giving me the impression that I'd accidentally purchased tragedy, not romance. He played as if Agamemnon were about to sacrifice his daughter in exchange for fair winds to Troy. I'd given him a hundred, so maybe he wanted to prove he'd earned it. Natalie hesitated, scanning the room, taking stock of the people watching us, and briefly, I wasn't sure I was seeing this right, but there was fear in her eyes. She seemed to shake with self-restraint, hunched up on herself like a cornered animal. That you take risks, she said. Each, each time neither of us spoke, the violinist jammed in trills and crescendoed, and each time he noticed our lips moving, he dropped in near silence, though he occasionally punctuated our words by plucking a string. I wanted to take the wine bottle to the son of a bitch's head. Okay, okay, I lipped as subtly as possible and gestured, and the muscles of her face pulled in different directions. A smile began to take shape, and I think I heard sighs of relief at the nearest table. She started to speak, and the violin fell toward silence and I knew we'd reached the eye of this musical hurricane, that this was the word I'd been waiting for. And you have to take sexual counseling with me, she said. Yes, I told her, and moved to fit the ring under her finger. The violinist's bow jerked on the strings, a spasm of sound I couldn't believe was intentional unless avant-garde. She drew her hand back, pushing the ring the rest of the way, staring at it as if with caution, as if it were the first step in a highly experimental and risky medical treatment. 
The violinist regained control and once again started his climb. He plateaued with one interminable note as if beyond this moment the story were over and there was nothing else. It came to me then that she might be saying there was something wrong with our lovemaking. Yes, she said, but the question had long left me and I had no idea what she was talking about. In the next section, Andrew, the narrator, he goes on to Natalie's computer and um, snoops a bit. And he discovers that she's been in touch with Hugh for a long time, even though Hugh hasn't, the half-brother. She's been in touch with the half-brother for a long time and very frequently, more and more frequently as of recently. And that Hugh has not, Hugh has not been in touch with Andrew. And, he, and Andrew begins to believe that um, Hugh and Natalie have had an affair at some point in the past. And he uh, doesn't know how to, um, to, to broach the question. And he's terrified that Hugh's going to come back into his life. And the next scene is the first scene of their uh, sexual therapy class, the sex therapy class, when Hugh does come back into his life. I was hurrying, hurrying to the first class of a week-long course, the path to ecstasy, tantra, and sexual liberation, jogging to catch the tea when I heard Hugh call my name. I just stopped and turned as if only days had passed since I'd last seen him. He had the tanned, lined face of a military man who has seen too much and was sitting on a bench, derelicts and drug addicts on either side, this being Central Square. He looked stern and clean cut like a soldier from a war long ago. Hugh, I said. At that moment when I was struggling to throw plot, climax, and denouement all at once into my love life, my first test now awaiting me in a Pilates studio sublet for group therapy, I knew I should, have made this, I knew I should make this encounter as short as possible. I was sweating, the street glistened, heat lines rose, blurring the air like fumes, as if the world were drenched in gasoline, and any word I might speak would ignite it. He stood and came toward me slowly, his eyes moving in careful increments, taking in my posture, trying to determine whether I might hug him or hit him or simply walk right past him. When I did nothing but stand there, he shook my hand. I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time, he said. Through a grate at our feet came the chiming of tea passengers inserting their cards. Metal wheels screeched on the rails and hotter air billowed up beneath me as the train arrived. Yeah, I managed to say, we've been, a long, we've been long overdue for a good catch up. Nah, he said, I mean, we should really talk about real things. I just nodded. There's so much going on in the world, he told me softly, his eyes searching to the only available distance at the end of Mass Ave. These aren't good times. No one's willing to face it. If we want to survive, we have to reinvent ourselves. I didn't think he'd come to discuss politics and the tone of his words was at odds with his military face. Did you finish translating the book I asked? It's a, he's referring to a book that the father had kept that seems to be tied to their heritage. I'll come back to this later. Yeah, I don't think I ever sent you the ending. I found something about Estrada on the internet recently, a web page about him. It says he moved to the United States at the end of his life and stopped writing, so maybe he is related to dad. The train rumbled away beneath us, the sidewalk vibrating. I gave him my cell number and offered to meet after my class, not thinking, of course, that Natalie might expect me to practice what we learned. All right, brother, he said, as if he'd just finished a long, hard task, as if I'd been to war with him. He half lifted his hand, even as, if he, was turning, even as he was turning away. On the subway platform, I stared at the tracks. A Starbucks cup and a sodden copy of the Phoenix lay between them. I tried to quell panic. What did I hope to achieve with Natalie? Marriage had become an artificial structure, cleanly evacuated in the postmodern age. Endings no longer gave us meaning, nor was there a universal definition of happiness. At least that's what I'd come to believe after years reading critical theory and cultural studies. Though I'd never felt the urgency Hugh did, maybe humans were hardwired with, hardwired with a need for story, and I was failing because of my lack for quest. I hadn't even thought to be on time for sex therapy. I was becoming a masochist, a fanatic, the Rambo of failure. When I arrived, 10 couples and Natalie stood at a buffet watching pornography, a close-up of penetration. Their faces showed a clear loss of appetite, the food in their hands held like fish guts. The teachers, a skinny, asexual couple, were rocking on their heels with pleasure, and I learned that the program had started with an informal talk, then the buffet, and that the TV, positioned nearby, had been turned on halfway through the meal and cocktail, ch cocktail tail chatter, in medias res, as the critics say, of a heated sex scene. Afterward, we discussed our responses. The couples are mostly administrative types, the exceptions being a stately attorney and his blonde figurehead, a tall Haitian man of an indeterminate age and his unaffected doctor wife, and Natalie. Most admitted to shock or arousal, and when it was my turn, I said, I felt really guilty, not because I meant it, but because I didn't want to sound like everyone else. And besides, an extreme scene merited an extreme response on the basis of literary standards. Everyone looked at me and the teachers hummed and twiddled their fingers like villains. The discussion then turned to more scientific things. Diagrams of reproductive organs, the controversy of the G-spot, 
angles of entry, glands and lubrications, glands and lubrication and pressure points. Pretty dry, the woman teacher punned, and we all went, uh-huh. You see, sex starts with your feelings, she said, and elaborated the way a magician unfolds a handkerchief into a parachute. Had we signed up not for the 101, but the 001 class, remedial sex, no credits offered, pass, fail only? My peers did not seem dysfunctional at this level. She told us we had to start with the basics and that later we would learn wild things, the poetry of postures, diving crane, tiger and gazelle, knotted stakes, bee on the stamen. Her androgynous and interchangeable partner was now distributing questionnaires. Take these to your corners, he said, and fill them out in total honesty. We were given pens. We answered the questions. Threesome, foursome, anal sex, preferences, fantasies, infidelities. Then the pens were taken away. Men and women were made to line up against opposite walls, the way, we, the way we'd done at elementary, elementary school dances before the teachers picked partners. Now, said one of the instructors, as rolls of tape were passed around, attach the questionnaires to your chest and go and let everyone read them. I want you all to read them and then look the person in the eye and focus on accepting, not forgiving because that implies something wrong was done. Just accept. I taped and roamed, and no one appeared impressed by the other's sheets until I saw the stately attorney reading Natalie's and nodding gravely, as if to say this was a case he wasn't likely to take. She was staring at me from across the room, blushing, her eyes glassy with fear or shame. She strode from the attorney and let me read. She had a lot of little ticks and checks absent on my own sheet, and given the focus here on record keeping, I couldn't see why they shouldn't be dated. Then I read the last one, Have You Been Unfaithful to Your Significant Other? I didn't look her in the eyes. We returned to our walls. The instructors brought folding dividers to screen off the woman as if now that we'd been overwhelmed with regret, it was time for synagogue. The light from the big studio windows was muted by the division, evening sudden and a tilt and ceremonious. The instructors explained the first ritual of acceptance, the apparition of the woman, not with her earthly baggage, but as goddess. This is the dance of Shakti, instructor A said solemnly, as if addressing the audience at an avant-garde theater. The woman comes to you as primal female force. Men tend to be closed and limited, and their judgment is severe. It is only by accessing her true power that a woman can become free. Today we will learn this. The woman must lead. Tomorrow the men will perform the dance of Shiva. I grimaced and clenched as one by one the women were made to leave the screen and dance for us. Awkward in business skirts and blouses, all of them earnest and embarrassed, and with a predilection for Indian hand gestures and a gyrating of the body common to hula dancers. Then Natalie stepped out, fierce and red in the face. Lilies and orchids and roses had been set in pots, incense lit on brass plates and smoking from the stipples and pyramids, the cardinal directions marked with lavender mantles. She moved and twisted, Martha Graham and Twyla Tharp and Mary Wigman. I'd never seen her like that. She finished with an entreaty, staring at me, crouching and moving her arms as if pulling a chain. The Haitian man gave me a wide look of envy and amazement, and I stood and fled the smoky fragrance into the cool and empty night. The next scene is um, Andrew going to meet his half-brother, who he now believes has slept with his um, fiance. And I'm not going to read that section to you. I'll leave that to you. I'm going to skip ahead to the next chapter. And the next chapter is a different branch of the family. And it's during the Iraq War. Um, and it's um, told from a third-person point of view. And it's about a young man, young man, an art student named Francis whose father was a CIA agent and who the, the young Francis has been reading his father's journals and discovers that his father um, got a woman in Kurdistan pregnant in the 1970s when the CIA were there um, using the Kurds to destabilize Saddam Hussein's regime. regime. And this, this is a conversation um, after Francis's graduation when he talks to his father and confronts him about um, what happened in Iraq. And then the story later goes to uh, Iraq, but I'll just read this section here. The morning after graduation, after Francis's mother had gone home, his father invited him to breakfast at a nearby diner and showed up smelling of bourbon. He talked of the upcoming election, dismissing Obama and emphasizing McCain's military credentials. He explained polls and constituencies, not eating much, occasionally pausing to prod his scrambled eggs. Afterwards, they walked back to campus. Dad, you were CIA, weren't you, Francis asked. His father stared off, appearing unconcerned. What do you want, a good story? Of course I was CIA. You've been digging through my stuff for years. I didn't think I needed to tell you. I mean, for Christ's sake, you're reading my journal. It was pretty vague. Yeah, well, sorry about that. They plodded across the green, its turf spongy, not yet firmed up by summer's heat. Here's my favorite story. It's my best. I'll tell it, but you won't believe it. I was in Valle Grande in the fall of 1967. He said this as if nothing could be more meaningful. 
One morning, the guy I worked under woke me up. He told me to get dressed and give him the money I had in my pocket. A couple hundred pesos, I guess. He kept telling me to hurry. He said, let's get a look at stone cold dead history. At the hospital, he paid a guard to take us to the basement. There was a man lying on a metal table. He had scraggly hair and a beard and was wearing only some ragged pants. He had bullet holes in his arms and chest and in his throat and his hands were missing. He'd been cut off very neatly here at the wrists. He turned to Francis. Guess who it was? Who? God damn it, Che, fucking Che Guevara. He wasn't someone whose case I was working on, but seeing him made me feel that I was doing something, that what I was doing was real, that I was part of a larger project. This screenwriting book I read said that every scene has to convey a feeling. That was the feeling in that scene. I mattered. I was a big shot. Francis and his father stopped walking. The sky was cloudless, sunlight slanting against their faces as they squinted past each other. This wasn't the story Francis wanted, not what had captivated him in the journals. And here it's in italics, it refers to the journals. She had a moon face and small lips, her hair thick about her shoulders. I went to her room and knocked softly. She pulled back the door, holding a shirt on which she had embroidered continuous shape, skirt on which she had embroidered continuous shapes like the stars and tile work. I gave her a pair of torn pants and she inspected them and then looked up quickly at my face and nodded. When I started to turn away, she touched my wrist. She did it quickly and softly with just one finger as if testing the temperature of metal. You know, his father said, when I was in college, I used to think I was an artistic type, but I wasn't. I spent more years in the field than Che, but he wrote books and made something of his experiences. He left his legacy. I couldn't. The CIA didn't do things openly. That's how it was. He sighed and cleared his throat, a grating, disappointed sound. Dad, Francis said, his heart beating fast. I want to know about Iraq. You know everything there is to know. What about the woman and, and the child? He'd wanted to say your child. His father was staring off, his skin drab and slack against the unremarkable bones of his face. <clears throat> there was nothing to be done. I was in a hope, it was a hopeless situation and it got even more hopeless after I left. What about now? Forget it. They walked until they came to the dorm. Francis turned, but his father didn't look at him. He just stood, staring at the building as if counting its bricks. What did you think of my screenplay? He asked. What? My screenplay, the one you dug up in my drawer. It was okay. Yeah, right. I should have put Che in it. I almost did. I was going to have the main character see Che's ghost. But then I thought to myself, why would Che give a fuck about this guy? He's a loser. He's totally irrelevant. I'm going to skip ahead to um, uh, another piece in the book, which goes back to rural Prince Edward Island in the late 1800s and ends up going to the Boer War in South Africa and then to World War I. Um, and I'm just going to read the opening of that story, and then I will stop and um, take questions. And this, 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 this chapter is called The Song from Far Away. When Joseph was five, his mother placed the fiddle on the kitchen table, its dark varnish nicked and rubbed to wooden places. Beyond the open door, gulls called and flashed over the ocean, the wind rising and pulsing. I cannot hope, she said, that you'll be as brave or as good a man as my brother Louis. Louis but I can ask that you be half as good a fiddler as he was. Already in Joseph's ears, as if inside waves and wind, was the sound not of his dead, was the sound not of his dead uncle's fiddle, which he'd never heard, but of his less brave and less good father's. The exuberant rhythms played on the docks, in the dance hall, or even on the stoop of the house in the evening when there was no fun to be had elsewhere and nothing else worth doing. Its music would follow Joseph through provinces and countries, through lives so different that if his various selves met at a crossroads, they'd be wary strangers and refuse to shake hands. He would carry the fiddle over three continents and through two wars. All the empire's people have been scattered out across the world, his mother told him as if she had pity for the Scots and Irish, but she had none. She told her stories of her Acadian ancestors that the British deported from Nova Scotia in, the, in 1755. Splitting families and dumping them here or there along the coast all the way down to New Orleans. Moving her finger up the map, she showed Joseph how their ancestors had to climb back up the continent, she said, as if the east coast of the United States were a sea cliff above which sat New Brunswick. They resettled in Caracet, where she grew up on the southern shore of the Baie des Chaleurs, across from the Gaspé Peninsula. But in, the Jan but in January of 1875, eight years after Confederation, the provincial government passed the Common School Act. The intention, avec l'intention, she reiterated, of eliminating not just Catholic values, but the French language itself. That was when my brother, Louis, your uncle, Louis Mayou, don't you forget his name, joined the other men to organize riots and show those damned English constables that we were the rightful owners of that place. Joseph's uncle, Louis, was 19 when he defended the French language and an Englishman shot him. 
She told this story so often, it seems he'd been shot time and again, as if his breast could not be pierced enough to shed a quantity of blood worthy of her tears. But unlike Joseph's mother, his father, whom she'd met the summer he'd gone to Calicut for work, did not tell stories, which is why Joseph's mother didn't know until she was pregnant that his father's last name, Dion, was not a French variant poorly spelled in a register by a near illiterate colonist, but an Irish surname from County Clare. A handsome sailor who spoke perfect French and knew little of his history, just that his own father had had such a mighty craving for potato, he'd fled, Canada to, he'd fled to Canada to get some, but mostly ate cod, and fell in love with a young woman in Miscouche, Prince Edward Island. Though suckled at her French breast, Joseph's father was to be schooled on his father's fishing boat and fiddle. At the time of the riots, Joseph's mother was 17 and pregnant, and as if to distance her from her grief over Louise's death, his father sailed her to his family home on Prince Edward Island, where she learned from his mother that the origins of his where she learned from his mother the origins of his deceased father. And six years later, like his father, he disappeared on the ocean, either over it or into it, escaping or dying. She was furious regardless, as if he'd fled to death with the passion of a man rushing into another woman's arms. From that day, she referred to him as Le Maudi Irlandais, the damned Irishman. And I'm going to stop there, take questions now. Thank you. Great. Um, so I wasn't surprised to hear that it used to be longer, um, just given the sort of time scope and distance scope of the piece. Um, so I'd love to hear you talk maybe a little bit about like, you know, how did it go from the seven pages back down to the 200 and especially um, it seems like you kept not sort of a certain lump of it, but like threads from maybe fairly disparate pieces. Um, so how did you figure out what to keep and how to weave it together? That's, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I, I, um, I struggled with this, obviously, I mean, 20 years is a long time to be, to be dragging a book around, I suppose. And you did some other stuff along the way. Yeah, I published some other books. <laughs> Fortunately, that would be a little sad if I hadn't. But this one, um, I, I, I think at first I had this impression that to tell a long historical story, I had to fill in all the gaps. And I began to realize with time that that's, that, that's sort of an artificial construction. And we read these long historical novels that sort of try to explain history from a third person omniscient narrator. And we realize, and I've sort of realized with time how artificial that is, how in a sense inaccurate that is. It kind of gives us a sense of coherence where I don't think we should have one. And I think that most people experience history as sort of these, um, you know, sort of like looking back along a dark street at night and you see a few lights here or there where, you know, areas are lit up and you can't see the whole landscape. You can just sort of see these pools of light across a, a very dark landscape. And I thought that's more how these characters are experiencing history. It's certainly more how I experience history. Um, even when we're in the middle of a historical event, you know, that's how we're often experiencing it. We're struggling to, 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 to understand it. There's so many different ways of looking at it. And so the book has you know, these very different points of view. It has a very first person contemporary point of view. It has, um, you know, it, it has one story that's narrated from the first person plural, it's a we narrator, it's a narrator of a town. So it, it's looking at this history from all these different points of view and sort of stringing them together, but very loosely and trying to give the reader a sense of, of you know, how basically you can kind of try to construct a family history and understand how your family got to be that way and how war shaped it and how art shaped it and how national ideology shaped it. But you're not going to ever have the full truth. You're going to kind of construct the truth that suits you based on the, on, on the artifacts that you have. And what parts kind of get activated by what people when, right? Exactly. It's very, it's yeah. very based, much based on chance and based on sort of the surrounding ideology in that moment. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you know, the wars that people are fighting, they're national, the, you know, the, the way they identify with a certain country. Um, you know, influences greatly the stories they choose to tell. Mm. It's interesting that there's actually several characters in the book that, that carry with them certain objects over time. So whether it's a violin or a book or a story. So in some ways, it's, it's sort of interesting to think of you carrying the story for decades before kind of bringing it to the fore, uh, to bring it to kind of light. Um, one question I had is sort of um, kind of is a theme that comes out throughout the text is this importance of stories themselves and the stories we tell about ourselves, the stories we tell about our past um, as a way to kind of define and understand who we are and maybe even there's sort of illusions that these stories could, could lead us to becoming sort of 
better versions of ourselves potentially. So I was I was curious, sort of the the way that you thought about these narratives, these these stories that we tell about ourselves or our families or, or about one another. Right. I, I I mean, there are a few ways to look at that. I, I suppose what these people are trying to do is justify or to sort of explain themselves to some, to some degree. To sort of say, we have this North American history. We belong here. We've, you know, we've interacted with other people. Um, you know, there's, everyone wants to feel that their story, I think, has some larger purpose and some larger meaning. And, and in this sense, the characters are all, you know, there, I guess I would have to respond very differently to different stories, but you know, the, sort of the, the, the ideological viewpoint of the different characters shapes how they, they, they then choose those stories to, to sort of create a character that they can believe in. So I, for example, you know, protest song is one of the longer stories in the piece. And it's a guy who's a singer of protest songs whose father has told him all these stories and he's retelling, he's, he's a singer of protest songs from the sixties who's gone on to write anti-war novels. And he's telling the story of his own father and his grandfather and is trying to, in a sense, construct himself as this rebel, um, somebody who's rejected this history. And yet, as he writes the story, you can see his blindness and that he's also part of it. He's also very much um, part of the, this white North American colonial experience and can't extricate it from himself from it entirely, can't necessarily call things what they are. Um, so, you know, I, I try to look at how people try to construct themselves, but, but there's also this question of, you know, you want a narrator to be a little unreliable, right? You don't want this narrator to just come and tell you a story and you go, oh yeah, I trust this guy 100%. You, so there's this tension between the story they're telling about themselves um, and what you can see as a reader, um, a critical reader looking at the material they're using to build their stories. I'm not sure if that answers the question. Yeah, no, I think that's great. It's interesting too, because there, in some ways there's inconsistencies at times between the stories these characters are telling and then their behaviors. And then I think it's interesting as the book progresses and you start to get these different kind of insights from different perspectives. Um, I think the story is about Emelise, this character who comes in later and the story, there are, there are sort of conflicting stories about her fate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which reflect the, the storytellers themselves but that's sort of an interesting piece too. So you even see inconsistencies between these narratives, depending on who's telling the story. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I, I suppose there's got to be cautious of spoiler alerts. But um, yep. <laughs> but there is, you know, that that the Emily story is the third person one, where it's a small village in Quebec, and the people have constructed a story of this girl becoming a saint and sort of being redeemed by God when the village when the villagers had actually pushed her out and she became a stripper and had this horrible really brutal life and they have sort of constructed this life of suffering and redemption um, <clears throat> that they retell over and over and over again so you hear the voice of the village in the we it's the, they're the villagers reassuring themselves that they've done something wrong even though what you find in the next story is that it was a there was an incredible act of violence and that you know she the, you know the sort of the notion is that the suffering was by her own hand in one story and then she was redeemed by god's grace whereas in the next story you realize that you know she was N not uh, the suffering, you know, the suffering was not by her own hand. Um, and, and that was sort of, when I was looking at the piece, I was thinking a lot originally about, you know, these people who go to war, who experience war directly. And then that story, it's somebody who experiences people returning from war, who experiences the violence that comes back with the soldiers, that comes back to the, you know, the villages after people have spent years on the front fighting and killing people. You mentioned sort of this unreliable narrators, right? And one thing I'm often really interested in or sort of trying to track across a book that has different kinds of perspective um, is the question of like psychic distance, right? So when when a word is used, like is that the character or is that the writer, right? And how, how far apart is that space or how close is that space? Um, and I felt like you were at sort of, or like, there were different degrees of psychic distance from different characters, and I was really interested in following that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely, yeah. That that was something I, I was I really struggled with in the story, and one of you know protest on this place I think where I struggle with it the most, um, because you have this character who thinks he's very enlightened, who thinks he's this left wing political crusader, um, who's really not taking any more risks in his life, and is sort of embodying sort of the bourgeois safety that he himself would have hated as a young man. Um, and he's telling the story of his father 
And in that story, um, the father encounters an indigenous man who is uh, uh, from Harvard, is doing research on the uh, Wounded Knee Massacre. And um, in that space, the father would be calling this man an Indian and would be sort of viewing him from a very, through a very racist lens. And the grandfather through an even more racist lens because the grandfather participated in the Wounded Knee Massacre. And so there's this tension in the story where he kind of, the narrator kind of tries to say, hey reader, you know, these are people of their time. You know, he talks to the reader and says, these are people of their time. They're not necessarily monsters, but unless it was a time of monsters, you know, but then as you, as the story progresses, you realize that he can't fully reject his country. He's moved to, the narrator's moved to Canada. He's abandoned the US. He was a draft dodger, but he's still in a sense, there's a, there's a place like his son, his half son, Hugh, who went to fight in Iraq, um, Andrew's his other son, um, there's a place where Andrew says he thinks his father would have actually been proud of Hugh to go to, for, to go and fight in Iraq in this weird way, even though his father was a singer of protest songs because, you know, he was fighting for something. Um, and also, you know, there's a sense that maybe it wasn't really about doing something, doing the right thing. It was maybe more about just having a crusade. And the guy becomes more attached to his fight than he does to actual the reasons behind it. But to come back to the psychic distance question, there are a number of places like that where I thought, how would people speak in this time? How would they view things in this time? And so when the character's learning about the Wounded Knee Massacre, um, it's right before the Greenwood Massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And there's a sense that this character is suddenly learning there was this massacre of indigenous people, and he's incapable of seeing that it's a massacre of African-Americans that's about to take place right afterwards. And even after that happens, the character never, or never succeeds in calling it a massacre. He, you know, he kind of looks at it, back at it, and he, he can't fully make peace with it. He had a grand, his grandfather carried you know, the, a bone watch fob that was taken from the kneecap of a black man who was lynched. You know? So this is sort of this family where this guy wants to embody rejection of his family, and yet when he tells his story, they're part of his story. And you know, he has a psychic distance from them, and then I, as a writer, have this further psychic distance where I have to say, I can't just make everybody woke, right? You know, I can't suddenly go, you know, that's not very realistic. And there's this tendency, I think, in literature right now, I've been writing, a, working on an essay about this. There's this tendency, I think, to want to write all these really good white protagonists. And, you know, pure, white, pure good, white, woke, white, woke, woke white people become a new form of triumphalism. It's sort of like, you know, there's always, instead of, instead of taking ownership of history and engaging with those questions, there's a sense of absolving, us, of absolving ourselves of it. And so I didn't want to go down that road. I don't know if that answers the question, but. Yeah, absolutely. It makes me think of a passage, so I'll try to dig it up, and Ian can ask you something, and then I'll come back to it. Okay, sure. Perfect. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are several themes that I, I think are really interesting kind of throughout the book, and I suppose one of them, and you see this, I think, particularly early on in the book between sort of Andrew and his, his, um, his brother Hugh, and, and part of it is this idea of sort of lived experience for, versus this more kind of contemplative sort of academic experience and sort of their they sort of represent sort of two opposites in that way but I think throughout the book even with like Leon later on when he's sort of learning about this this character Rafael Maria Estrada through his his reading so I thought it was really interesting to think about the way we as individuals grow and to what extent that is through sort of this through the mind versus through the kind of the, the more kind of sensory world around us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that there is that question also within that of sort of where do we get our information, right? You know, how is somebody going to go, the, is the guy who's going to fight in the war um, and the person who's writing about it, reading the news and coming up an opinion on it, how do those two people speak to each other? How do they see eye to eye? Um, you know, it, I think, you know, for, for, for people in the audience, one thing that is not always um, clear is that, or that I should, I should, that I should clarify is that these two brothers, when their father dies, they find this book by Rafael Maria Estrada, who it's in Spanish and tells the story of this Mexican guy who fights in the Mexican Revolution. is very heroic. And the father's last name is Estrada. Their last name is Estrada. And so they come to the conclusion this is part of their family history. But they don't know how the two connect. And so the book is really stringing all these different moments together back to, con to connect back to where that book fits in their history. And so there is a lot of sense of these people who are reading creative fiction, essentially, right? You know, are yeah. reading, you know, fictions, or constructing, you know, fictions that people have made about their lives. Um, and 
are being influenced by those fictions. And what's interesting, I think even the ones who live, you know, between lived in, in, you know, sort of more intellectual experience, the people who have, you know, like the brother Hugh, who goes off and does all these things, he is trying to replicate fiction in his life. He has read all this fiction and he's read all these, these, these imaginings of how we can exist in the world. And he's going, well, I'm gonna go live them. He's very, he's very much a literalist in that sense. But it go, it's more than that. That would be a, you know, be a reduction. We could be, you know, I don't want to sort of reduce what his experience is just that. But he's read all these fictions and he's out there trying to live them. The brother is very cynical and is saying, you know, these are just stories. You have to look underneath the stories. And the deeper themes, we can't take the stories too seriously. But then he, in a sense, becomes a nihilist and he doesn't really have anywhere to go with his life. It's just this sort of tension between, you know, where do we go? Do we believe in all these fabrications that we've been given and do we act upon them? Or do we become paralyzed with inaction because we don't know what to believe? And uh, for the folks who are viewing, if you want to start populating the Q&A with your questions as you are thinking of them, you're welcome to do that now. And Denis, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your experience as a journalist. And you've been to some pretty intense war, um, war-torn places that have um, really had a lot of their conflicts fueled by tribalism and this antagonism between essentially families that have been happening for years or millennia. And I'm kind of wondering if that experience um, sort of populated some of your uh, intergenerational uh, themes of, of war here. Yeah, I think that there's this tendency um, in the United States to have a very ahistorical way of looking at things, sort of thinking that we're free of history. There's this, you know, the sen our sense of freedom, I'd say, um, it leads us to have this delusion that we are, you know, free agents and that, that we're not responding to events that happened generations before. Um, whereas I think in other countries that I, where I've lived, people are much better at articulating, hey, this happened three generations ago and we're responding to this now. And so that um, that certainly influenced my writing of the book. I think that um, what also influenced how I approached it was the sense, even when you're, you know, in a war zone or you're, you know, you're working in um, Afghanistan or Iraq or the Congo, it's very hard to figure out what happened anywhere. You know, you read so many different descriptions of a battle, you read so many just different political descriptions, and you're right there when it's happening and you still don't have access to, to the truth. And everyone's constructing it very quickly to justify um, their, their goals, and often on the basis of, you know, very, like you said, very old um, historical or political um, conflicts or alliances. So I think that that certainly deepened my sense of, how history affects us and um, the way we, we talk about it. Oh, I can't you're hear. muted, Bronwyn. There we go. Yeah. All right. Um, I found the passage, I think, sort of connected to what you'd been saying about sort of how, you know, how we write characters. It was on 161. Um, and it's a moment also where Joe, which, I mean, also that section, you know, the eye of that section really sneaks up on you, or at least it did on me, right? I let that passage really starts in third person. And then mm -hmm. suddenly there's the like, I knew later. And it's like, who's this eye? Where did this eye come from? You know, and it's only then we realize that a specific character is talking to us, not just a like a, an omniscient third person or a like, yeah. you know, focalized third person. Um, but the moment on 161, right, where it says I, I would write over and over years later trying to picture it accurately to see these men as men and not ideas of a lost mythical America. I was afraid that Raphael was less a person than a prophetic bearer of a message, a token figure like Henry Clay or Dick Rowland come to nuance the humanity of our family to give us by their inclusion in our story for the jurisdiction over America. Right. That feels yeah. like that connects to the thing you're talking about there. And it feels like this is a moment where this novel is a little bit like, hey, I see the risk I'm taking, maybe. Yeah. Right. Or like lampshading a little bit this yeah. ethical question. Absolutely. Yeah. That was I struggled with that passage a lot. And I and I and I spent a lot of time thinking about it and saying, well, you know, how much do you want to signpost to the reader, you know, what I'm doing? Hi. Um, you know, and that I'm aware of it, that I'm aware yeah. of the risk and that I'm aware of the danger and that I'm not doing it blithely. And I think that there's, you know, with the question of cultural appropriation that came up a few years ago, 
Um, I, I, I would have had been on panels with white writers who would just say, I have the right to write what I want, when I want, about whoever I want, and no one's gonna tell me not to. And I'd say, well, it's not really, that's not really the question. The question is more of representation, right? It's if white people have no experience of somebody from a different background, a different ethnicity, um, and they represent them in the way that white people have always represented them based on the way other, people, other white people have represented them before, are we then silencing somebody? We're creating, an, uh, we're creating a story for somebody that is not their own story. And I, thought, I think that a lot of minority writers, ha having been sort of confronted with narratives about them that are inaccurate, have had to push back and sort of re like reinvent literature in a lot of ways to, to, to push back and say, no, this is who I am. You know, women have had to do it and minorities have had to do it and say, like, you're putting a narrative on me that's not my narrative. I'm gonna, put, I'm gonna write my own story. And I haven't seen white male writers do that in the same way, you know, because we're very confident that the story being told is the right one. And we are the one putting stories on other people much more than the stories are being put on us. And so when I began looking at this question in the book, I wanted to think a lot about how a white person who's somewhat aware of this would try to reconstruct a white narrative. You know, is, he's aware, he's telling the story. He can't dissociate himself from it. He can't say, you know, this is, he's a product of this story. And he doesn't know how to reject it entirely. And he's sort of paralyzed, you know, living in a basement in Vancouver, writing protest novels, anti-war novels that nobody reads. Um, and, you know, he doesn't fully understand what happened historically. He doesn't have any of the relics that anyone else had. He's lost them all. He never even heard the song he's writing about. Um, and yet he knows that when he writes about these people, um, you know, the, the indigenous man from Harvard and um, the African-American man in Tulsa, he can't really get access to them. And in a sense, he's appropriating their stories just to give himself a narrative that is more expansive. So he's like, you know, it's like, in a sense, even in the act of mentioning them, he's, um, he's solidifying his position as somebody who owns North American history. That our pain includes them, right? It's sort of like, yeah. since you've mentioned it, it's now part of your territory. Exactly, you know, and there's this, there's, you know, I think, and, you know, Frederick Jackson Turner's writing on the frontier, he talks a lot about how the white man goes to the frontier and he learns indigenous ways and he appropriates all these things. And then Richard Slotkin came years later and wrote about, you know, the frontier and said, well, he, the white man does do that, but it's not to become the people he's learning from, it's to replace them. It's to, you know, it's, you, you appropriate what you need from them in order to push them aside. And so in, in a sense, I was sort of trying to, ref, you know, and this character is struggling with that question. He's, he, he doesn't want to write, and he wants to include them in the story, but he doesn't know how to make them human in the story. Thank you. It's interesting too with it, with this character and being sort of the setting of, of in Tulsa. You sort of mentioned the this idea of sort of an ahistorical American experience, and it's interesting because this character's father is is you know was a received a medal at the Battle of Wounded Knee, and he doesn't even have an awareness of what this is, right? He doesn't know about this event. He's kind of blind to what's happening around him in Tulsa, but it also made me think a lot. You know, this is a pretty horrific moment in American history, but in fact, a lot of people don't know about it, right? Mm -hmm. so Absolutely. Yeah. There, but there's also, there's sort of a, a, that's part of our narrative too, right? Maybe that is something that's sort of an American thing of what we choose to ignore too, or what we sort of kind of pass over, or what mm -hmm. aspects of stories we take. I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah, and what we painfully admit and then kind of justify or move on from very quickly. You know, and sort of the character can painfully admit this happened, but then he positions, positions himself as a hero, right? And it's mm -hmm. a very, you know, quick reversal. It's saying, yeah, there was this massacre and this other thing happened that was, you know, he doesn't, can't name it a massacre. And then suddenly he's the hero fighting the bad, big bad America. And, you know, it's a very quick reversal and no real action occurs from it, right? What occurs from it is, you know, a lot of narrative about himself, but no real change. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how much sort of um, artifacts show up, right? And I feel like that's one of the ways that we have access to history is through sort of what's left, either through documents or through artifacts. Um, I wanted to ask you sort of about research for writing fiction. And I know, you know, you do research for nonfiction or journalistic writing, um, but what role does research play in your, in your fiction or what kind of research did you engage in for writing a work like this? Um, quite a bit. I've researched all the stories pretty thoroughly and um, 
went to a lot of the places. The second story takes place in Kurdistan and the conversations there, you know, with the, with the deaf men at the table, for instance, um, I actually had a lot of those conversations. And so I would just keep notebooks and fill, fill them, you know, and say, well, I want to convey this accurately. And I could never have described that otherwise. Um, so in some cases I will go to a place, historical things are a lot harder. And so I'll tend to read a lot of accounts of them and try to think about who is telling this story. You know, there's a sense of, it's, I, every now and then I read a historical novel that I think is trying to get it right. Like what was the real history? What really happened? And I think that's really slippery and risky. And, you know, I don't know that we need to give people the illusion that there is a right story. I think there's enough of that. That out we there. have that access versus that reach. Exactly, exactly. And so I, I would read them and kind of go, what is this character? Why is the character telling the story? And which of these narratives is that character going to choose? And so I would often look at the, you know, what were the, what were the political, you know, what, what were the political stakes at the time that led people to tell different histories? And I would try to learn those different histories and then figure out where the character would place um, themselves in relationship to them. But yeah, I mean, uh, I, probably in terms of research, I have to think back 20 years. It's probably a lot of, <laughs> certainly a lot of visiting places, a lot of, you know, reading books and um, listening to people. And Why other they, times maybe oh. where one piece could, could go into journalism, could go into fiction, sometimes feeds multiple sources, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I mean, I, I was sort of um, surprised, you know, to see, you know, in a sense, how much the journalism would filter in and how much, you know, reading even just books of fiction about an event would filter in because sure. fiction is a way of sort of um, engaging with our, our historical heritage so sure. even that was part of it and why i mean why do you think it took you 20 years to decide that this book was done i mean were you actively working on it that whole time or did it sort of go dormant for a while and then kind of reach up and grab you or you know how how did that process work for you um well so uh 20 years so um yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't sure if I heard 28 or not, but I couldn't tell. Oh. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I think I said 20, but yeah. Okay, okay. There's a bit of an echo, so I was like worried. I was like, no, 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 not quite that long. But, um, 50 the, um, years! <laughs> 50 years. We can just keep adding to it. You look great. <laughs> yeah. It'll end up sounding like a, like a foot on those fish tails. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, the, I, I think with this one, I worked on it very steadily for certain periods. Mm -hmm. And um at one point just realized it's not working, you know, it's, I don't know what to, what to do with this. And I wrote some other books and I think writing other books and that were slightly more traditional in their format, um, slightly, not, you know, dramatically more, but slightly more, um, just allowed me to think, get some distance and think about how I built narratives, how I, um, how I told stories. And there was a point at which I was a little burnt out. I had just been doing a lot of journalism, a lot of writing. I was putting out a book, um, I think that every two years, if not less than that, and um, I wanted to do some study, some research in some other areas, and take a little bit of a backup from writing a little bit. And during that period, I picked this book up again and thought, "What do I have here?" And then I sort of saw the solution because I kind of the pressure was off. I wasn't really sure I even wanted to fix it, and then I began thinking about it more and more. And I thought, "Well, let me do an experiment. Let me, you know, restructure this." and see if I'd want to rewrite it this way. And that, I saw that that worked. And, um, and when I showed it to publishers, they responded immediately to it. So it was, you know, that, that was kind of the moment where I thought, okay, I have a story here, but um, I really didn't think I was gonna publish it. What was the solution? What was your, what was the glue? I mean, the glue was really just taking, it was 700 pages. It was taking out 500 of them, you know, yeah. and, and throwing them away. And saying what's what are the what are the stories that are essential to this, mm. and what are the pieces that really are that 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 link this together? What is this actually about? And I thought, well, maybe this will be another book at some point. And I sort of what I saw when I read the whole thing was there's here's a very clear story within this huge project, um, and the rest isn't adding that much to it. Mm. You know, this is stands alone is sufficient on its own, and um, and the whole book was you know it sort of spanned many more countries and much more history. And I thought, you know, for readers to understand what I'm doing, they don't need all of this. They can get it from just these pieces here and enjoy the story a lot more and not be confused. 
-hmm. In some ways, it's maybe a book about fathers and sons. Right. You know, yeah. and about paternal abandonment or, you know, filial rejection, right, that gets echoed across these generations. Oh, yeah, the sins really of the father. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I guess or sort I of missing brothers, you know, missing brothers <laughs> yeah. or estranged brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also think that I think some of the other stories were maybe too on the nose. Mm -hmm. You know, they were like, they were trying, they were trying to hit the issue too direct, direct, some like issues too directly. And when I pull them away, you know, you want to have a sense of these questions under the surface, but you don't want to be banged, you know, because someone banging over the head with them repeatedly. Historical event where somebody happens to be like right where every politician and major event is <laughs> right. taking place by convenience. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or where they suddenly come to realize exactly what's happening historically and tell the reader, you know, so I, I yeah. thought. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and I wanted to um, share Sophie's question too, because it's kind of on the, the same the same wave here. Um, Sophie says, hi, Sophie, we love you. Thank you so much for reading for us over such a long writing process. You must have left a great deal behind and the final product must be very different from what you initially envisioned. Um, what actually helped you feel that you'd hit the finished product when you got where you are? Or do you feel that way? Do you actually feel like you have, are you there? I, I think, uh, you know, with books, I could revise them endlessly. I mean, there's not a single book I've written where I don't pick it up and think to myself, well, I should have done this, or I should have done that, or I could add this, or I could do that. And at a certain point, you know, we hit our human limitations. <laughs> and we kind of, you know, there's a point where you go, also, there are other things I want to write, and I want to engage with different questions. Um, and so I think with this one, I really wanted to get to a point where I felt that it was, um, you know, there's the, 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 the it, it connected, it flowed, it told us a, a complete story. Um, and, you know, there's a sort of intuitive sense you get, this is the story. It's hard to say exactly how your, my brain comes to that conclusion, but you know, it's the, that did it, does it feel complete? Does it feel like, it's almost sort of, you know, hearing a song, you kind of can hear the rhythms, the music, the characters, the shifts, and you know that, it 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 gets loud in the right places and you know there's shouting in the right places and it gets hushed in the right places and when you get to the end you can feel that this is the closure and that you know you're you're answering the right questions and leaving the other the right ones open so it's i think it's a very intuitive thing it's something very hard to explain but certainly um you know i didn't publish it thinking wow this is a mess i hope people fall for this you know <laughs> <laughs> certainly like i thought okay this works you know this is i, I can see how this will work. I love hearing people's writing metaphors. I have a friend who talks about it as like tuning a guitar, which is similar to the song, right? It's like, is there a clear through line that goes through it? Um, can you talk a tiny bit just about like the nitty gritty of writing processes? I always love to hear like, not just how do you write in general, but like, do you ever write by hand? You know, do you use any particular programs? Who reads your work and when? Anything like that that you'd like to share? I try not to write by hand because I can't read it afterwards. Oh no! <laughs> so <laughs> You're I, a paleographist. Yeah, I'm with the gen. If I would need that. I have done with the generation that grew up with a computer close enough by that I just spent way more time on computers, and um, I don't have good handwriting. And I tried to do a lot of notes and outlines and sketches with paper because I had some my notion that it was more, you know, tactile and it would help me. And it doesn't. I just, I, I, and so what I tend to do now, my my writing process has evolved a lot. I used to sort of just write this you know i would sort of launch myself into a story and um write it and then revise it and spend years revising it and a lot of my books took a long time as a result um and then i i think just you know having read so much and written so much i began to write in my head a lot more and i would tell myself the stories and i would i began taking writing time where i wasn't at the computer and i wasn't trying to get anything down on paper and so i would take I'd say, I'm going to work on this book. I'm not going to be in front of a computer. Like I'm getting go. away from the word count. Yeah, getting away from That's everything. a Sophie thing. Sophie writes very word count, which is amazing. But that's no, an like interesting permission, I think. Yeah, I would just go and like just, just sort of live the story, close my eyes and go through it and see the characters and see the places and think, does this work? And so my process has shifted in that way much more towards, you know, I think it's – being at a computer is hard in the body and if you know the amount of hours spent to edit a book and get it you know revise it and rewrite it if I'm stuck on a scene I try to get up and go sit somewhere and see the scene and hear the language and 
I will compose a lot of it in my head and then I'll go and sit down and write it. Um, so I've, I do much more of that these days. That's interesting. So um, maybe share another question from our folks that are attending. Um, Zev Wexler says, you seem to identify more with the first selection you read than the others. And he is wondering why. Um, it's interesting. I don't identify more with that section. I think that it's for its first person. Um, and so it kind of comes across by nature as being more intimate. And it is a very much more of an intimate story. Uh, this guy who's sort of revealing his vulnerabilities and his frustrations. Mm -hmm. But I think the illusion of first person narrative is that you want to convince the reader it could have happened to you. You know, it's Ideally, you'd like the reader to read it and think, wow, you did that? You're admitting to it? <laughs> um, but I didn't do any of those things. I didn't have any of those experiences. And um, No I, violin know, proposals. No violin proposals. No sex therapy in a Pilates studio. <laughs> um, you know, but, uh, but I collect stories. And I listen to a lot of people tell their stories. And, uh, you know, when I hear someone tell me a story that's good, I think, oh, I can use that. Um, but that story is one that I, I would say, if there's any sense that I were, I, mean, I rewrote all these stories a lot. That story I rewrote many, many, many times. And it has, it is easily one of the oldest stories in the collection. Um, there, I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been through a lot. And, you know, it has changed very dramatically. So the characters have been there. In different forms and have changed a lot and so I think when you when you've carried characters with you for you know two decades and you've rewritten them it can sound very you know intimate or personal but it is entirely fiction. It's also interesting because this is sort of the, the introduction into the book but it's also the most contemporary of the kind of mm -hmm. different periods we look at so it's right sort of and through the first back. person. Like, yeah and then and then through that story we kind of tie into the past a bit but that's sort of an interesting start piece tumbling <laughs> yeah. really yeah. so maybe in between that and the first person it becomes a more sort of relatable sort of initial yeah. story that we're then drawn into yeah i could have actually that could have actually happened in my lifetime and i wondered if if those characters were going to come back at the end you know, I, I wonder, I mean, how you thought about ending, right? Because yeah. that seems like sometimes when we, you know, there's sort of like that, that temptation to do the cycle in some sense, yeah. right? And so I was curious as I neared the end where, where you were going to land. I in think the we're original asking draft, for a sequel. <laughs> yeah, if I could take the other 500 pages and make a sequel. <laughs> and, and the characters would return, some of the characters would return more in that case. Um, Hugh returned, with the original version, Hugh returned many times. Mm -hmm. um, and... Andrew was glimpsed a few times, but Hugh was much more of an important character and he returned many times. And in this version, he returns, I mean, they do return and mention here or there, right? Mm -hmm. um, and make cameos, but, um, but not any great degree. But I, I, when I reread those, the, it just didn't feel necessary. It felt yeah. like I was trying to follow a formula where you, you know, like mm -hmm. you said, like the, you have to have the return. And I thought, right. eh, I don't think yeah. it's necessary. Well, I think you also, t in the final kind of story you have, you get some more insight into the, the, the background and the history and the importance of this book that, that their father had carried that they don't know about. So you're yeah. still, as a reader, you're getting important insights that relate to you know, both the artifact and these other characters and that legacy of history um, without having to you know, explicitly say, and here's Hugh for a final scene kind of thing. Exactly. But there's sort of that temptation then to cycle back and reread it knowing what you know at the end, right? Yeah. Which is a nice yeah. invitation and maybe a better place to leave you with, oh, hang on a minute. Let me go and see what I know now and see how I read it differently. Yeah, that's, yeah, I think that was more what I would hope the reader would do. Is kind I, of go I, back and I will do that. <laughs> review. Um, I think one of your, I mean, uh, your overt um, themes is colonialism, and we have a couple of really great questions here from Misha Stone, who, again, we adore, and Tim Mayo, um, that sort of tie back to that. Um, so Misha says, have you read any novels that you feel wrestle with the complexity of whiteness in an honest way without absolving, without the absolving tendency or is it not finding this that fuels you to do so? Um, that's a really great question. I, there are no novels that I look at and think to myself, wow, this one really nails it and um, is, you know, is the novel that I, um, 
that, that answers that question for me. I think I occasionally read novels that touch on it. Um, but um, I would say I think it is, you know, not finding it is what fuels me to a large degree. You know, I don't, I don't see those stories. Well, the previous novel I published was called White and took place in the Congo. And it's, a, and it's you know, it's, it's first person. It's told from the point of view of a journalist who's working there. It's, he's going to find a Kurtz figure who's sort of in the rainforest, who works in nature conservation. And so I've been trying, I've been struggling with this question for a while. When I wrote that, I really felt that I wasn't, I wasn't finding um, the kinds of stories I wanted to be reading. I wasn't getting enough of those, those stories. Um, and so I chose to explore that. Um, and, you know, I think some of the readers who approached that book said, oh, they really didn't know how to approach it because they want, they, you know, the narrator seems so much like the writer and they wanted to like the writer and the, they didn't really like the narrator. And, and, you know, and they sympathized with him and they related to him at points, but they also really disliked him. That's exactly what I wanted. I wanted to kind of create this space where you don't have discomfort. the good white. And the, yeah, a place, place of discomfort. Because I think there's this tendency to have like the good white and the bad white. And the bad white embodies everything we, we say we're rejecting, but we're not actually rejecting. And, the, you know, the good white is, has this triumphless moment where we feel like something has changed, even though nothing has changed. It's just a story we're telling ourselves. So, um, so there aren't a lot of other people out there who I've found who have really made me feel like, you know, um, they're engaging with it in a way that, uh, that at least satisfies what I'm looking for. And so I've sort of been trying to approach it from a few different um, angles. So Tim Mayo um, says, in terms of white people appropriating another culture's story, what is your opinion of American Dirt? And he says he hasn't read it, but he's about to. So I have not read it either. Um, it is also on my list of things to read. I have heard what people have said about it, and I, I can't form an opinion without having read it myself. So, but uh, um, I will read it, and I'm happy to to have an email exchange about that once I have. Great. And then anonymous attendee, um, sort of flowing from there, says, "Forgive the general question. I haven't yet read the book. That's okay. It just came out this week." Um, how is the tribalism we're living through now in the U.S. different from and the same as what you've witnessed in conflict zones elsewhere in the world? Oh, okay, that's a big or question. Is, or um, is this a whole other event? <laughs> that, that, yeah, that may be an entirely different book. Um, I, 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 I mean, there's, you know, I'd say every conflict is different, sort of, you know, uh, um, you know, Tolstoy's statement about, you know, unhappy families all being unhappy in their own way. I think every conflict is very different in its own way. Um, and, you know, partisanship and, you know, polarized societies are driven by very different factors. And I would say that, you know, the parallel that we see, that I sort of tend to see in the United States at the moment is that a lot of the polarization here is being driven by outside forces. Um, which used to be, you know, one of our specialties, right? We drive polarization in other countries in the exact same way, you know, the, the British Empire drove them in that way. Um, European powers um, during the Great Game, you know, exacerbated polarization within societies in order to, to divide and conquer. And I think we're seeing something very similar right now where um, divisions are being exacerbated within our culture um for you know to destabilize us um you know it's why people are out burning down 5g towers and you know um afraid that 5g is giving them covid you know there's a lot of disinformation aimed at us at the moment but i'd say that is where i see the similarity the most um i think that i would have to dig and spend a lot more time and i'm not sure that the parallels beyond i'd have to think of some parallels that were useful before i'd voice them but thanks for the question it's a great question and then we have a question from Paloma. Um, which of your books are you most proud of? Um, wow, that's a hard question. I usually finish books and I hate them. I'm kind of, you know, <laughs> I finished them like, give me my life back. And I can't <laughs> believe I spent all these years working on this. Um, and, but I, you know, I, once I get distance, I'm like, oh, okay, well, it's, you know, maybe it wasn't that bad. Um, but I, you know, I always have an attachment to the first one I published, which is Vandal Love. Um, you know, in terms of, I think, the the voice and the way the sentences are crafted. When I look back at that, I often, you know, have a, a lot of connection to that. And I think the second one, which is a memoir, Cures for Hunger, 
which is about growing up with my father who was a bank robber, um, is one that it took me 17 years to write. Another one I carried for a very long time and I started writing it very young. And it, that was just such a challenge on so many different levels to, to, to tell that story. So I, I have a very high degree of attachment to those two books because you know they took a long time, they overlapped with each other and they sort of met, you know, one was sort of me as a, as a young man trying to, Vandal of his museum and trying to respond to the, the sort of lost history of French Canadians, of Franco-Americans in North America, who um, in, in the United States have, you know, very much been written out of American history to a large degree and have a very complicated history. And I wanted to engage with that story as someone who grew up with a, a cultural identity that I didn't understand. Um, and also sort of, um, you know, respond to the writers who influenced me. So it's a much more, much more literary book where I was really engaging with the writers who inspired me to be a writer and not, you know, be a bank robber. Um, you got to give them credit for that. Um, so it was sort of, you know, this, this uh, homage to uh, my literary inspirations and uh, Curious for Hunger was much more personal and uh, much more about what it's like to grow up when you have a father who's very violent and, um, you know, driven to criminal activity and how do you find your own identity and how do you make peace with the history that created that person, which was also a very violent history. And so I think I'm, I say I'm most proud of those books, I guess, you know, but, um, the best but, is yet to come though, right? Yeah. I'm always telling myself that. Yeah. <laughs> have you read, um, Molly Brodak's memoir Bandit? No, I have not. It's just also about having a bank robber father and also really thoughtful about narrative and sort of family legacies. Well, I feel like there should be some like retreat for everybody who has a parent who's a bank robber. <laughs> yeah, right. a lot of it writers. can't be that huge of a group. I don't know. I know. <laughs> you well, you know, know. the golden age group, yeah. <laughs> the, gold, the golden age of bank robbery, there was you know, 5,000 bank robberies a year in America. And so I feel, and you know, some of them are serial bank robbers, but I think a lot of their children went on to be novelists and they were writers. <laughs> you gotta so, do something with it. Do, 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 do <laughs> psychological <laughs> exploration of that trajectory. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Yeah. You have a story, that's for yeah. sure, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think we're starting to run out of time, but um, if there's anybody else out there, oh, we do have another question. Um, Kermit, yay. Um, Kermit Blackwood says, um, hi, Denis, terrific. Your books are always compelling and a real challenge um, and require reading over a span of time. My question, how does gender feature as to witnessing history? Excellent question, Kermit. Who has the power to define an era if a woman witnesses the awfulness of American history? How is that recorded when male-dominated narrative um narratives define so much of what is known so first of all hi kermit um it's great to see you thanks for um for being here um and that's a fantastic question mm -hmm. and it is certainly i what i would say all of my books sort of struggle with this question of male violence and um i'm gonna, I'm gonna circle back to the question and a uh, very um by kind of describing um, how I, I learned to, to read literature. And when I was, you know, uh, in, my, like, in my teens, I was reading a lot of Faulkner and a lot of Cormac McCarthy. And I was hearing, you know, all, you know, all these young male white writers talk about regeneration through violence. And there's this sort of sense of like, yeah, America has this violent history. And there's this, the, you know, there's this creation of this new society from bloodshed. And, um, and, there are, you know, all these books, I think all these writers have their, certainly their strengths, but what I began to realize was that there's this very imperialist self, just, you know, sort of self-congratulatory um, uh, uh, undertone to that, which is that, you know, who died? Who is, where, where what is the, regen who, who regenerated from this violence? Who was brutalized? Whose bodies were brutalized? Whose bodies were used? You know, indigenous bodies, black bodies, women's bodies, the bodies of people who were indentured servants. You know, there's so, you know, the bodies of the poor, really, the bodies of the poor and, and you know, the marginalized. Um, and I, I began to get this real discomfort with this sort of romanticize, romanticization of male violence. And so, you know, with Vandal Love, um, with all my books, there is this, there, there is a lot of, there, there are these men who um, are powerful, are violent, and sort of are leaning on a mythology of male violence. 
um, you know, sort of to sort of find their identity. And what I try to really explore through that is the way that that uh, mythology leads them to destroy themselves. It, it sort of turns them into foot soldiers, right? The man believes he has, is inheriting a strength, but what he's actually inheriting is a mandate to go and do war against people. Even if that doesn't mean he goes to war, it means just be a soldier in society in a violent way that ultimately destroys him for the benefit of people he'll never meet. Right. Um, and, I, and I wanted to explore that in different ways. And when it comes to gender, it was, I think, a struggle for me because um, these violent men had been so present in my life growing up. You know, I sort of, I, I, has, I really struggled to write female characters when I was younger. I mean, when I wrote the memoir, I thought, you know, how do I write my mother in this? She was very influential. She had a huge impact on my life. And I look now and I think, well, I'm much more the product of my mother than I am of my father. And yet I identified with him so strongly as a child. And I, 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 I defined masculinity through him and had to sort of deconstruct it through him. And so when I was writing um, Into the Sun, which is a book about Afghanistan, which is a book about the civilian surge in Afghanistan, so it was all this money that was poured into Kabul. And Kabul, I think, was the fourth or fifth fastest growing city in the world. Um, and people came from all over the world and became a sort of boom town, like a Wild West frontier boom town where you had mercenaries um, and weapons contractors coming in. I thought, I'm going to try to tell this from the point of view of a gender fluid woman who does, who doesn't, uh, doesn't identify with the feminine role she's put in. She often passes as a man in the society. Um, has the Hazara people, she's half Japanese. The Hazara people are um, descended from the Mongols and, um, and oftentimes people who are half Asian of, you know, Chinese or Japanese can pass as Hazara in, um, or who are simply, you know, Korean or Japanese can pass as Hazara in Afghanistan. So she passes as a Hazara man at times. And the story, she tells a story of, of, of um, a group of people who die in a car bomb. And um, one of the characters is a woman who, in a sense, struggles to disidentify with, um, with male, with, with sort of like what is glorified in men. In a sense, she's attracted to violent men herself. She likes you know, these powerful, aggressive men. That's what, what she's drawn to, even though these men have damaged her life. And, have down, and it goes back to her childhood and sort of looks at that. And so um, with that book, what I thought was, you know, I grew up with these narratives of violent men and the mythologies of violent men. And how do I take these narratives and place them so that someone else is telling their story and someone else is containing that story and then slowly redefining it so that we can see the violence um, from a larger distance. And we can tell that, you know, even if, even if the woman's name, the narrative of the women in that story um, are in many ways being overshadowed by the, the violence of the men, we can tell that there is another story around that. Um, and it creates sort of space for the reader to have some cognitive dissonance between the glory the men think they're seeking and the actual violence that is coming of that glory. Um, so I'm not, you know, it's, 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 there's a lot of ways to, I think, approach that question. Um, but I, um, I certainly, um, I certainly, it's certainly something I've struggled with a lot. And I recently took a computer science class for fun. And I wrote code to analyze all my books and decide, determine how many times I use she and how many times I use he. And I um, found that I use he way more than she. And then I pulled all the verbs that follow he and she, and I compiled them. And I um, figured out how to write code so that I could look at only the verbs that were used exclusively by men and only the verbs that were used exclusively by women. And I was shocked at how sexist I am. I thought, oh my God, this is terrifying. You know, like the men have these hyperactive verbs. He yelled, she women. wept. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and there was one place where a man's cradling something, but he was cradling a gun. So, you know. Oh. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> at least so, give him a kiwi. Um. <laughs> exactly, something, something cute. A kiwi. <laughs> But but I looked at this, and my, my goal with it was really to see, um, you know, do I, what kind of verbs do I give first person male narratives, first person female narratives, or I'm putting myself in that position? What kind of verbs do I give, you know, and, and I really found that um, I was, you know, one, one way I was trying to engage with male violence, and so it made sense I'm writing more about men, and it made sense I'm writing about these aggressive verbs, but then when I thought to myself, have I fully, you know, I can deconstruct that, and I think I have worked pretty hard to deconstruct that, but have I sufficiently worked to um, When to do you see... critique and when do you replicate, maybe, right, is a question. Exactly. It makes me think of Vonnegut with Slaughterhouse-Five, right, and that sort of like 
writing an anti-war book or like writing an anti-glacier novel, right? And it's like, can you write an anti-glacier novel? Can you write something without glorifying it if you are telling right. it, right? Yeah, it's like the kind of the famous line, there are no anti-war movies, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of it's very yeah. easy to glorify it. And then if you're gonna, you know, if I'm gonna reinvent the way I write men, male characters, um, how do I reinvent the way I write female characters? And, you know, do I begin to, and that's, that is something I've been thinking about a lot and working on. And I would like to say I figured it out when I was 18, but I have not. Um, and, and, and interestingly, writing a bunch of computer code to take my books apart and give me lists of words taught me a lot more than I thought it would as a project. I sort of just randomly picked it and thought, well, you know, I, I need a class project and I'd like to know if I'm a sexist. And then I thought at the end, I had to present, when I had to present it at the end, I said, well, okay, so the conclusion is I'm a sexist. It's a one or a zero. It's a one or a zero. <laughs> yeah. I love how you're looking at that on the level of form, though, you know, yeah. and at that, yeah, because I think that's a place where we can also act, right, is what you're thinking, like, all right, every single word choice is in some ways a larger choice, Absolutely. you know, and what does it mean to act on that level? Oh, but yeah, then, I, mean, I, showed, I showed the list of verbs to people I knew, and, you know, the, 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 the woman had, what was interesting is the men had, I think, I pretty much, you know, it was three pages, it was many, many, many verbs that only men got to use, women never got to use them, yeah. they were exclusively used by men. And then I looked at the verbs that were exclusively used by women. So I kind of, you know, get the big mass of verbs and I would pull those out. And, you know, they were, you know, like cooking and cleaning and secretarial work. And it was like, I was thinking, Cringe. oh no, oh no. And there are plenty of verbs that overlap that they both sure. used. Sure. But it was sort of just, you know, where, where did those places happen? Mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, it was very, um, anyway, yeah, very confronting. And I see Paloma's comment here. Um, I, I'm going to publish an article about that. That is definitely yeah. something I'm working on. So just um, for the benefit mostly of the video, Paloma's question is, will you please publish an article about your computer code findings? It's fascinating, super fascinating. It, it's, in fact, it's a really interesting kind of emerging field of like computer assisted content analysis. And I've done some work with colleagues in Europe on some of these techniques. And it's interesting because it's now going even beyond this, the stage of like sort of word clouds or even word associations, but you can start to sort of derive like broader themes, which is sort of interesting to think about, yeah. like, you know, how, what's sort of the actions of characters, what are the adjectives we use, as well as sort of what are the broader kind of themes that kind of cluster together around, um, whether it's gender or other identity or things like that. So. I mean, cause I very much had the question, you know, I will often write these male, male characters that I'm very critical of. And then I be, and, and, and even like in protest song in the book, you know, a male character who's writing his history. And then I began to think, wow, am I really all that different? You know, maybe, you know, I'm critiquing them, but maybe in the same way he's critiquing his history, I'm critiquing my history and I'm just going on as if nothing's changed, right? So is, is there any way you can get an angle, you know, you get another lens to look at that. And I think that it has influenced how I've been thinking about gender and writing more and more. And, Certainly, I think there's a lot more space to write about that these days as well. Well, that's great. Um, I suppose we should wrap this up. Any final thoughts, any of you? No, you're, you're thought it out. That's cool. <laughs> um, well, I just I want to thank everybody who joined us tonight. It was really it's this one of the great benefits of this terrible situation that we're in with the pandemic is that we're figuring out more and in some cases better ways to connect. And um, Denis, I had told you that I had a bad old email address for you, and had been sending you like lobbying, <laughs> you know. Um, wishes to do an event with you for about the last year, actually. And um, as we were feeling some confidence with Arthur McGee, I was thinking really hard about who else would be amazing to have in the series. And lo and behold, this is a true story. Um, I came into a message from Denis in my inbox. And so I'm just thrilled that you could join us from sunny California. And um, it's just, it's really great to have you with us. So thank you. And thank you, Ian and Bronwyn. Um, 
you guys have been through so much um, just between the trauma of what's happening at Marlboro, taking care of your students, and then you're both going to be evicted <laughs> from your homes shortly. We got a bit of an extension. <laughs> yeah, we got a, we a little gotta bit. Stay. We got to stay. Of yeah, yeah. yeah, because yeah. the music school is is not kicking you out as soon as they would have. Um, but thank you so much for for being here, and I just want folks to know that we will send a follow-up from this event and it will have the link to this video and also a link to Denise's book so I think that's it anything else guys just thank you to Denise it was a, a really it was a great read it was a great kind of series of conversations we had to have around it too which is great well thank you for taking the time I know that you both had a lot of work and I really appreciate the questions and I can imagine that adding another book to read during plans you know the the finals is pretty rough. It was fun. Oh, okay. We're reading machine. Yeah. <laughs> it was a fun break. It was a fun excuse for an escape. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. we are hoping to have more of these events before July. So okay. stay tuned. All right. Good night, everybody. Okay.